Great. Thank you very much, uh, Lenny. And um, thank you, Marsha, for your efforts to help set everything up. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining today. Um, I hope that everyone is uh, healthy and safe from wherever it is that you are joining. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and especially a pleasure to be a Research for Life partner because of the mission alignment of the LENS and Research for Life to provide equitable access to knowledge. The work that Research for Life is doing to provide support to users and stakeholders with training, marketing material, and stories of change highlights to me that research, and especially the broader innovation ecosystem, needs organizations like Research for Life to drive this change. All of us need support to not only be aware of, but also to understand how to use tools and resources that support better research, innovation, and outcomes that solve problems and improve society. So I'm grateful to be a part of the Research for Life program, and I'm grateful for the support of the Research for Life team. The LENS is a project of the social enterprise Cambia. At Cambia, while inclusive access to knowledge is necessary, it's not sufficient. The mission of Cambia is more utilitarian. Our objective is to help solve the problem of problem solving by making each actor or participant in the innovation ecosystem more productive at what they do. This means that researchers are enabled to be better researchers, inventors are enabled to be better inventors, Policymakers can, policy can do their jobs more effectively. In each case, professionals have access to the knowledge they need to make evidence-driven decisions informed by an open, transparent, and shareable platform. The Lens believes that the planet faces many challenges, so many challenges that we need participation and support from everyone to address and solve these problems. So the lens exists to provide inclusive access to knowledge in an open and transparent way. Only with inclusive access will we benefit from the ingenuity of all people in the innovation ecosystem in a way that helps to address the challenges that all of us face collectively. So I'll segment my talk today into three parts, an introduction to the lens with some slides, an overview of the lens.org platform, showing some case studies and then introducing key functionality of the platform. And I'll finally finish with enough time for Q&A. If you have questions, please feel free to post those in the, um, in the chat and uh, Lenny's going to assist me to moderate those at the end. And you're welcome uh, to go to lens.org and follow along with my examples. Uh, before I jump into the uh, sample searches, I'll show you where we appear on the Research for Life platform. So what is the lens? Uh, it's lots of different things to different people, and I hope that after today's introduction, it will mean something very specific to you uh, to help you do your job more effectively. And if you work with others, you'll be able to help those people you support to understand and use the lens as well. As I mentioned earlier, the LENS is a project of Cambia, a social enterprise whose mission is to democratize real world problem solving. The LENS exists to promote inclusivity by making knowledge accessible as a public good that is shareable and reusable. The LENS was developed through philanthropic support and investment from organizations that support its mission over the last 20 years. The LENS provides discovery, analytics, and research management tools on top of a comprehensive collection of scholarly literature, metadata, and patent literature linked through citations. In the examples and in the Q&A, I will try to go through exactly what we mean by discovery, analytics, and research management or metrics. It's worth noting here that at the lens, we are advocates of open, and we acknowledge that open can mean different things to different people. But I'm puzzled that while the world talks about open access for literature and even open science, there's little attention paid to open metrics. And we collectively continue to use closed proprietary tools for metrics and research assessment. So the ideas behind the lens were conceived with contributions from many dedicated individuals. The founder, Richard Jefferson, is a highly cited molecular biologist who did some of his original research in the late 1980s in transgenic agriculture. 
he patented some of his research and proceeded to launch something called open source biology with the intention of making the technology widely accessible. There was one company that was well positioned monitoring what research was coming out with a team of people who knew how to engage the IP uh, system and write patents and then knew how to produce um, products after they were patented. Um, and uh, that company um, ended up uh, taking uh, a great, or looking at um, Richard's research and writing patents. That company was Monsanto. They created a very successful product line out of uh, Roundup Ready. Um, Richard, through this experience, Richard um, didn't belie Monsanto for doing what they do well, and, and they did do it well. They took that technology and turned it into successful products. But he did reflect that researchers didn't sufficiently understand the intellectual property system, and that there's two parts of it, not just property, but also intellectual, and that they have an opportunity to participate and use this um, knowledge more effectively. He also recognized that patent literature generally uh, wasn't sufficiently accessible, which was especially true in the uh, early 90s, uh, but for many different reasons remains, uh, remains true today. Um, so out of all those uh, experiences, Richard and the team um, went about to creating a precursor of um, the lens.org called Patent Lens and launched it in 2001 as the world's first free and open full text patent platform. They developed the platform uh, for the preceding decade. And in uh, 2013, notably, they uh, launched uh, a pat patent sequence uh, platform that allowed users to search for patents by the gene sequence. Um, that platform continues to be developed today and is accessible on uh, lens.org. And you can, um, you can try that. We will focus most of our uh, most of our examples today on the patent and scholarly works platforms. In 2014, uh, Cambia added non-patent literature, mostly at the request of users to have that facility alongside the patent information, and rebranded as the Lens instead of the Patent Lens. The platform's been up and running for 20 years and funded by philanthropy, as I mentioned earlier. And notably, it's different from other platforms that might appear to be uh, free or open in that it is privacy and confidentiality assured. Um, some providers of patent information make their business model around uh, creating profiles about users or tracking what's being searched. Uh, that's not the case with the Lens. The Lens is built on uh, two primary content sets. Those are the scholarly works and the patents. The scholarly works are ingested and deduplicated from four main sources. Those four sources are Microsoft Academic, Crossref, PubMed, and Core. And from this set, we create a, um, a, a database of almost 230 million scholarly works, of which about 50% are journal articles. We extract 1.7 billion scholarly references from all of this information, which allows us to link the content and also allows us to create um, citation counts that are of interest uh, to people tracking uh, the, perform or the relative quality of research output. Uh, I can note that Microsoft Academic uh, announced in early May uh, that they will be shutting their service down at the end of the year and the Lens has plans to maintain access at, with the same breadth and scope that we have today. The patent data is extracted from uh, four full text sources, those being the EPO, WIPO, USPTO, and the Australian Patent Office. And we have bibliographic information that tops up the coverage to 105 jurisdictions. I mentioned earlier that we extract gene sequences from patents in order to make those fully searchable. And we also index on biological organisms so that you can search by species. We think that one of the things we do uniquely is break down uh, the silos between content sets and also break down or we create connections between the guilds of participants in the innovation ecosystem. We uh, 
harmonize all the data, linking it through the human intelligence of an author um, choosing a reference or an inventor choosing a patent that they um, think is relevant to their invention or even a scholarly work and the patent examiners who do the same. This helps us to create a network um, of, of technology areas and information uh, that our users can mine for insights. Uh, we also are working on efforts to harmonize um, individuals. So it is unifying uh, authors and inventors and unifying entities, whether it's a author affiliation like a university or an applicant or owner of a patent, which would also be an institution. Uh, in all, we extract 2.4 billion document linkages, which help our users um, to mine the data and visualize the insights that they uh, need in order to uh, make the decisions that they have. I talked about the four main uh, content sets that create the scholarly works data set. Um, to uh, harmonize those, we use a meta record strategy. That meta record uh, strategy allows us to maintain unique metadata from each of those four sources uh, and also collect additional metadata that's relevant to any particular scholarly work. Um, so we assign a persistent identifier, the lens ID, um, across that deduplicated uh, set of scholarly works, and we maintain all of the uh, metadata facets uh, from each one of the sources, including the provenance of that metadata um, so that in case we have a, a problem in the future or we choose to prioritize different metadata uh, to showcase to users, we can do so easily. We have a paper describing our meta record approach uh, to this content management. Um, it's available here. These slides, uh, as Lenny mentioned, will be available afterwards. Uh, I realize you can't get, click through the Zoom screen now. So on the back of the uh, two different uh, content sets, the patents and the scholarly works, we provide access um, through the lens.org platform and we create five different apps. Those apps are the patents and scholarly works where we have discovery analytics and metrics tools, uh, the PatSeq, which is a, uh, discoverable, a, discoverable, a discoverability tool to mine um, patents related to a specific gene sequence. Uh, PatSight allows you to search by a a citation and see how that uh, article links to a web of related papers. And INFORM, uh, INFORM is the International Industry and Innovation Influence Mapping. What we do there is track how the research output from an organization um, influences the patents of a, a patent filing organization, usually a company. Uh, what we think is that the INFORM tool allows people to see these connections um, as translated into patents, which is an intermediate step uh, before it turns into a, a product and has social impact. We have two management tools that I'll talk uh, a little bit about if we have time, uh, collections and uh, which help users to create content sets that easy to reuse and share that information with their peers. Lens Profiles is in beta. Um, it was launched uh, late last year. Our intent with Lens Profiles was to simplify the use of ORCID. Um, if you're not familiar with ORCID, Research for Life had a ORCID seminar um, not long ago, and you can access that, um, a recording of that presentation here. The lens profiles was originally intended to solve the problem of adding patent, um, your patent portfolio to your ORCID record. Um, as we started building around um, the ORCID uh, persistent identifier platform, uh, we also heard researchers say, well, not only is it a little bit difficult for us to add patents to our profiles, it's also difficult for us to add uh, new papers. Um, so we made Lens Profiles as a front end to make it easy to update and manage the uh, manage your ORCID ID. Our intent was never to create a uh, separate persistent identifier alongside ORCID. It's only to reinforce ORCID as, a, um, as an open persistent identifier and make it easy for researchers to use that. 
On the front end lens profiles that, that we do have, it creates some um, graphical analysis of the uh, H index of an author, uh, their patent portfolio, their open access publishing record, uh, and other metrics. Uh, you're welcome to go in and check that out. Collections I mentioned is one of the um, management tools that's embedded in lens.org to help uh, to use, reuse, and share information. What collections allows you to do is create a content set of derivative, uh, uh, derivative of the, the lens.org um, database, looking at um, specific scholarly works or patents based on a search query or even manually curated and uh, make that either dynamic, meaning that it gets updated every time lens.org is updated, or it's static, meaning you don't want it to change. It's a, um, a set of papers that you want uh, to be able to use in your research uh, and want no changes to your analysis. Um, I'll pop into the work area on lens.org later and show you how to build a collection. I mentioned inform, and here's a quick snapshot of what that actually looks like. Here we're looking at Carnegie Mellon University's impact on uh, patenting activity. So the research output from Carnegie Mellon has been cited by these companies that you see here. And through the analysis of INFORM, we can see which fields of use, which um, areas of study um, the, that was of the most interest to these patenting companies. So this is a useful indicator so that Carnegie Mellon is not only reporting on the um, research that they're publishing, but they're also reporting on the, the uh, different areas of research that are having the most impact on, uh, on patents and, and, um, and having social outcomes. Uh, so finally, uh, Lens has a, uh, a video presentation by Richard Jefferson, the founder that's available here. He's speaking at the Skoll World Forum for Social Entrepreneurship. Um, that's a, a um, good opportunity to learn more about the uh, background and principles behind the lens. And there are support materials for the lens available at support.lens.org. Before I, before I jump into the platform, I just want to run through quickly how you can access lens.org through the Research for Life platform. If you're using the current portal, you uh, open the databases for discovery um, button that you see here, and you'll see uh, the three or links to the three lens platforms here. If you are using the new unified um, portal, you can select databases, and in the same way, you'll see listings for the lens.org resources. When you click on those, it will take you over to the lens platform, and we'll look at this in real time in just a minute. Okay, I'd like to start with my case studies by borrowing a template created by uh, Aaron Tay. Uh, Aaron Tay is a librarian at Singapore Management University uh, here in Singapore, where I am. He writes a popular blog called Musings About Librarianship. Last year for OA Week, uh, he created some templates to show universities how they can do an analysis of their open access publishing uh, performance. And I'm going to show you exactly how that can be done and, um, and also link into uh, some more information about, um, about a university in Uganda. Uh, but let me just show you what we have here. So this is a dashboard that Aaron created called uh, SMU Journals 2000 to Present. He used filters to create this dashboard. You can look at the date range he limited from 2000 to 2020. Um, SMU was founded about that time, so he probably did it for that reason. He looked at name variants for Singapore Management University and chose those. And he limited his publication type to journal articles only, which makes sense if you're doing an open access analysis. Uh, from here, we can see uh, the, uh, we, we're looking at uh, a dashboard. A dashboard is a collection of individual charts. Uh, I think we have six charts on this dashboard and each chart 
analyzes different metadata in the uh, database. I'll look through these first and then I'll show you how you can modify those so that you're analyzing the information you're interested in. First, we're looking at open access versus non-open access documents by year of publication. And we see a clear trend there. We're looking at OA uh, colors where it's segmented uh, more granularly than just yes or no. Here, we're looking at the average citation rate uh, for works published in OA and non-OA, and we see a clear uh, higher OA uh, or clear higher citation uh, rate for OA uh, articles. See the same thing with a um, split by OA color. We can analyze the OA by field of study. You can look at the uh, open access publishing by funding agency and look at the different fund uh, agencies that were funding research from SMU. And you can see um, a publisher analysis, see which publishers were publishing open access. Uh, you can break this down by field of study. And you can see the top most highly cited uh, OA and non-OA papers. So before we flip and look at another uh, school, I want to show you exactly how we can use these charts. Um, so you can open these charts because they're completely configurable. Uh, you can change the chart title, facets. I'm just going to make a simple change, which helps to change the way that we're looking at the data. I'll go from a stacked bar chart to a line chart, and then we'll close the settings and look at this. So interestingly, the OA access, uh, no doubt, has had a steady, I'm sorry, the OA um, paper output has had a steady increase. Um, the non-OA um, has has a, a steady increase also, but not as quickly. But here in the last year, it shot up. Now, this might be because of um, OA embargoes, which would make sense. And then in subsequent years, it would go down. But let's change this now. Let's say we'll um, turn off the institution at SMU and change to uh, Makarere University, just as an example. I'll select these name variants that we have, um, three, and I'll refine. So now I'm looking at the research output from Makerere University. Uh, the, there's a total number of um, 9,600 scholarly works. Uh, we can see that they, that 8,000 of those have been cited um, by other papers, and they've been cited a total of 266,000 times. We can also see that of those 9,600 papers, 158 have been cited by patents, and it's been, um, and they, those represent 437 uh, unique citing patents. They've been cited a total of 473 times, which means that uh, one or more of these patents has been citing multiple papers. We can see uh, the same analysis um, of open access publishing activity. Let's um, switch this to the line chart as well to look at that. You'll see that um, OA output from Macquarie University is impressive. Um, you can see that the OA citation rates are much higher and the uh, citation rates for OA green are, are very high. Um, you can analyze other output uh, here in the same way. Uh, now this dashboard still says SMU journals 2000 to present. Um, uh, so let's change that. We'll change it by, excuse me, clicking the save dashboard button. I will then change this to Makarere University OA analysis. Pardon my typing. Um, and uh, we'll leave this as publicly discoverable. And I will save that as new. And you'll see that it is now changed here. I can then share this link. I can click um, to copy it to my uh, clipboard. And I can share that um, with anyone. And they'll go directly to this page to see this same analysis. Um, Makarere University has been around longer than uh, SMU, so I'll change that to 1980 and get more uh, papers. I will turn off the 
uh, journal article limit uh, because I'm interested now in uh, all of the research output from the university. Yeah. And now uh, I've been analyzing the OA output, uh, but I'd like to do a different analysis. So I can clear these charts by clicking clear all, and then I can uh, set up new charts. I can set up uh, new charts on the dashboard by using the wizard to look at specific um, data that I want to analyze, or I can select a default analysis um, to choose one of these. I'll look at the citations dashboard so that we're looking at um, the output from, um, from just the university. Um, it, it's, but we'll, I'll show you a different um, dashboard that you can look at while we're comparing research output from all of Uganda. Um, and we can go through and see a different set of templated um, charts, just like the uh, charts that Aaron Tay had built for us were, were templated. Um, so now let's go in and choose a country, uh, Uganda and refine, and we'll turn off the institution limits. And refine. And now we're looking at the research output uh, for, for all of Uganda. Um, I'm Now it makes sense to do a slightly different analysis. I'll clear this and do a comparison of institutions. And I get a list of uh, institutions. So it's a different analysis for me. I will flip to the list of these 18,000 papers to show you some other functionality um, that's available. Um, first is the sort by um, selection. You can sort by relevance. This makes a lot of sense if you're doing a keyword search. Um, there's scholarly citations highest, um, citing patents highest. Um, if you wanna do it chron chronologically, you can look at the date published newest. Let's look at the uh, most highly cited papers. And we can quickly see some of the seminal works that have been published from, um, from Uganda. Um, on the right side here, we see an analysis of the different um, institutions um, that are publishing with a Uganda affiliation. Um, you can see that co-authorships um, in some cases are coming from outside of Uganda. Um, we can look at scholarly works over time, prominent author profiles, and prolific authors. We can go into any one of these records, and um, this one's a pretty good example because we can see here it's open access. Um, this one is probably not open access, uh, but from here, I could click through to the, the DOI, which would take me to the, um, the publisher's webpage, and we could see full text. Um, I, oh, this is open access, so I can, um, I'll just click on that to show you. This should take me right through. Uh, it's a Lancet paper, and we are at the full text. If you're operating from within the Research for Life platform, uh, I think you'll be able to access all of the full text that you have access to as it recognizes you. Um, okay, that gives you an idea about um, how to use the platform, uh, working from that example from Aaron Tay. Uh, next, I wanna show you a Research Institute analysis looking at ICDDRB. Um, based in Bangladesh. I prepared this search in advance. Um, the name variants, uh, there's a, a larger number of name variants here. Um, so it was easy for me to, to pull that together. Um, but you can do it the same way if you wanted to do it on your own, uh, type in uh, some of the keywords for the institution name and you'll see those, um, see the, the matching names appear. So I did, uh, ICDDRB has uh, 5,000 uh, works. Um, those works, uh, of those works, 4,400 have been cited by other scholarly works and been cited 184,000 times. Um, 235 of those, uh, those scholarly works have been cited by 593 patents. We'll come back and look a little bit more carefully at this. Um, just like in the uh, previously, you can sort this um, differently. You can uh, look at the uh, co-authorship analysis here. Scholarly works over time. I'll flip back 
to the analysis. And I can, um, the institution analysis is still appearing because that's what we were looking at with the previous, um, the previous example. So I, I will clear that analysis and go back to the uh, citations dashboard. So you can see the highly cited papers. Um, this shows you the top cited scholarly works. You can hover over each of these, um, each of these circles and it, it lets you know what that paper is, the number of times it's been cited by patents and the number of times it's been cited by, um, by other papers. Next, I wanna show you um, an idea what this inform uh, capability is. So let's look at the 593 patents that are citing um, the, the scholarly work published um, from ICDDRB. We'll just click on that. It will take us to that list of 593 uh, patents. We can uh, sort these differently if we'd like to. Note that the patent sort choices are different because a patent is, is different uh, than a scholarly work. Um, and we can look at who the applicants are for those patents. So uh, these are the organizations who applied for these patents. This might be uh, useful for uh, ICDDRB to be aware of who's tracking their research and using their research in their patenting activity. Uh, perhaps it makes sense to reach out to one or more of them uh, to uh, suggest a partnership. If these companies are using these papers that might be T plus two years or T plus three years um, after the author had the original idea, then it's an opportunity to partner to discuss ideas in real time uh, rather than waiting for papers to be published. You can see the uh, patenting activity uh, has, has increased dramatically um, over the last few years. Um, again, citing the, the research output of the Institute, um, you see the inventors and the inventor names and the, um, the document types there are the granted patents and the applications. We can analyze these uh, patents to look at the um, patent classifications. Uh, the patent classifications is a coding system used by the patent offices that, um, that, are, that represent a technology area. Um, so if there's areas of specific interest, um, that's useful information for uh, ICDDRB to be aware of. Um, you can look at this list of top inventors if you want to know who these people actually are um, and contact them. Um, you can see which jurisdictions the, um, the patenting uh, organizations are interested in. Okay, that gives us an idea of uh, how to see how to link um, from a, the output of a research institute into um, the patents that are citing their output. Um, I'd like to, to finish the examples with a company analysis for Sasol out of South Africa. Um, Sasol is a global multinational headquartered in South Africa with employees around the world. And we're going to look at their patent portfolio and their scholarly research output. Uh, this might be useful. If you are uh, affiliated with SASL, it might be interesting if, it, if you are a competitor to SASL or a vendor or a partner to SASL. Um, so we, uh, in advance, I did a name disambiguation uh, for SASL, a little more complicated because they're a, uh, a global multinational with lots of patenting activity. Um, you can see their patenting activity over time. Uh, they seem to have a period of about 10 years right here where they were uh, quite active, more recently uh, less so. Uh, you can look at their top uh, inventors, uh, the legal entities which are filing those patents. You can see which patents are the top cited patents, which is a signal of um, that that patent has been of great interest to other organizations. Uh, like the other charts, you can scroll over um, to see which patent that is and even click through to look at just that one patent. Um, there's other um, metadata that we can, we can analyze and you can um, look at that list and spend more time sifting through uh, to get a really clear idea of what uh, SASL technologies, what SASL's technology areas and their uh, patenting activities um, are.
I'm going to flip back and look at their um, scholarly works output. Um, but not only are they active in patenting, but they've also um, published. Um, there were 993 uh, papers that have been identified. Uh, over 10% of those have been cited by patents, and um, and those have been cited by 550 patents. So that's that the research they're doing is is very important um, in in translating to to IP and then to social outcomes is what we would say from these signals. Um, so you can look at which uh, institutions they are collaborating with um, so based on co-authorship. We can look at which journals they're publishing in top fields of study. Um, the top journal subject areas to get an analysis of which um, areas are of the most interest. Um, so here, before we jump into um, Q&A, I just want to orient you quickly through the whole platform. Um, we, we spent most of our time looking at uh, patents and scholarly works. Um, uh, PatSeq is also included in the um, Research for Life program. Uh, PatSite is also accessible, um, and this helps you to uh, analyze linkages between um, academic research and the patents. Lens profiles we talked about in the introduction. Uh, Lens reports um, is a, a tool that allows you to assemble uh, collections in a common technology area. Um, just briefly, we've got uh, several samples of Lens reports um, that you can uh, take a look at at your leisure. Uh, the Lens Reports is in uh, beta right now, and we hope to uh, release the production version before the end of the year. Um, once you're in the platform, I'll call your attention uh, to the registration. So you can use um, Lens.org without registering as a, an anonymous user. And that's no problem. If you do register and you sign in, as I am right now, then all of your uh, activity will be saved in your work area. So it saved my queries. It saved my search history. This should show the um, searches that I just did with SASL, um, the citing patents analysis, ICDDRB. Um, so this is helpful if you're, you're busy. And, and lost in your searches, um, it's keeping track of what, you've, what you're doing. Uh, collections, uh, I forgot to show you how to build these, uh, but you can um, build those and I can jump into those in a minute. Uh, once they're built, um, you can uh, set them up as uh, static or dynamic. If they're dynamic, they'll be uh, continue to be updated um, every time the, um, the Lens database is updated. And dashboard templates um, that you save also appear here. Uh, so you can see I have examples, the one that I just made, um, which is public access, and I have other dashboards that I've made um, that are private. Okay, I'm going to stop. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, the uh, filters, um, I, I showed you how to use the filters when we were using the um, SMU open access analysis, um, but I'll just call your attention that each of these um, is really a, a useful tool to help you to search um, in addition to the structured searching or the text editor searching that's available here. Um, all of the fields, uh, there's more fields available to search here than in the um, filters, but the filters frequently give you a good idea of what uh, data is, is accessible, um, which you'll, you'll want to know to avoid false drops in your, your searching activity. Um, Mark, could you yes. click? Uh, man, several people may have also attended the ORCID webinar, okay. so maybe you could look at that quickly. The ORCID lookout. Author. Okay. Yeah, let me um, do that. That's a good one. So the lens profiles, um, just briefly. So again, what we did here was not try to create another persistent identifier. We just tried to uh, link into the ones that exist uh, to make them more effective. So let's look at Richard Jefferson, the, the CEO of Lens, look at his profile. I know he's already linked, um, but there's a couple of Richard Jefferson's I think that will identify here. So this gives you a good sense of how this works. So you type in the author name, uh, hit find a profile. It's linking over to ORCID and checking. Um, so Richard's already linked, but there's some other Jefferson's that come up and you say, okay, uh, which one is you? 
So it displays the, the ORCID numbers that you can identify. We will go ahead and select Richard here. Um, so his status is ORCID linked um, because he's already made that connection. And that means that there's bi-directional syncing uh, between his um, research output as it appears on uh, Lens and uh, on ORCID. Here we see that his, he has a total of 52 papers, 74 patents, OA publishing ratio of 40%. Um, looks at his collaborative ratio based on co-authorships, H index, total citations, and patent citations. Um, you see the a chron chronology of his um, output of scholarly works and citation activity, and a list of those scholarly works. Um, notably, um, here you can also see the collections that he has created on Lens.org um, uh, that are publicly uh, accessible. Um, so I talked about the collections earlier, and this is one place where, uh, where that will appear. Okay, Mark, we actually have a question. Terrific. In the chat, and it's a complicated one for me anyway. Any plans to connect, this is from Christopher Southen, any plans to connect patent extracted chemical structures? You could contact PubChem, who have extracted 39 million structures from patents, and there is a URL there. Wow. Thank you very much for that. Um, we, it's a great tip. So let me just show you what we do have now when it comes to chemical searching. We do not, you cannot search by structure. Um, um, let me see. That there is a flag that allows you to look at, um, Okay, well, well, we'll take that on as um, a as a as a suggestion, and I'm I'm grateful for that. We'll um, make it easier to search um, by chemical structures um, in the future. Okay, I just asked everyone in the chat. Maybe someone can suggest an institution that you could search. Yep. Okay, so we're just waiting for some replies. Uh, some of you may work where there's been a reasonable amount of research and even some patents. So we don't, we don't. Oh, University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ghana, which is a fairly new institution. Correct me if I'm wrong, Fred. There it is. Yes, less, less than a decade old. A decade old. There we go. So this will be very interesting. Okay. We've got a couple more, uh, a couple from Nigeria too. Okay. Terrific. So we, we found University of Health and Allied Sciences. Um, and so we can analyze the co-authorships activity uh, quickly. Um, again, sort, you've got five citing patents, um, which might be of, of interest to the university while you're, um, while you're expanding and looking at partnerships. If you wanted to uh, look at uh, output in all of Ghana and analyze your uh, research output against peers in Ghana or peers even regionally, you could create a, a group of uh, universities and um, take a look at that as well. But um, congratulations on those five patents and um, terrific to see the, the research output. Okay, we have two requested from Nigeria. And one is, uh, I actually years ago did a workshop there, so I'm curious about the University of Ibadan, which is a very long established institution in Nigeria. And then we could look at the volume of works coming out of uh, Nigeria too. So that'd be very okay. interesting. It's a very I'm, large dynamic country. Yes, let me um, limit by Nigeria first to make my, um not embarrass myself with spelling and I'll open the institutions. There we are, Ibadan. Um, so it looks like it's uh, one of the leading 
um, and then the, the other, by output. other requested one is second, so we could look at both. <laughs> okay, let's. Um, oh, this is a name variant for Ibadan. So the second is this one. No, no, I'm sorry. It came on the last. Okay. It was previously displaying. I can give you the name after. Okay. Um, okay. So what? We'll, we'll, okay. So we'll refine by this. The data yeah. set um, that it was extract or looking at was those twenty-two thousand um, papers from just from mm -hmm. Ibadan. That's why the list is different. So I'll go back and look at all of Nigeria, and that'll reappear. Um, so from Ibadan, we've got twenty-two thousand uh, papers published. Um, 16,000 of those um, have been cited and cited a total of 300,000 times. So it's uh, impressive work quality. Uh, 260 of those papers have been cited by patents and cited by 940 patents. So we'll click through to those 940. Um, it's a, a number of sufficient size to be of some interest. And we see um, very not a health ink uh, seven Bridges Genomics, 4D Pharma. So a lot of life sciences there at the top. Uh, BI, looks like um, Harvard College has patented some of the, um, or has written patents that cite research output uh, from the university. Um, so that's, that's terrific. Um, I'll flip back. And, whoops. Um, and clear these. Let me go back. And so we're keeping Nigeria and we'll yeah. use those two. In fact, why don't I uh, keep all of Nigeria and we'll change this analysis and we can see the um, universities of interest pop up. So um, this is analyzing the output over time, top collaborating uh, institutions. But what we want to do is look at the an institution analysis. So I'll change to this default uh, that is institutions dashboard. So now within a country, this analysis makes a lot of sense because I know there's um, a number of universities in uh, Nigeria. So here we see a comparison of those research output and look at each one of those listed here. Um, the other research we can analysis of the um, the citing patents and citing scholarly works for each of the universities. So notably, University of um, uh, Ibadan is not only excels in the scholarly works out uh, citations, but also the, the citing patents. You can see the most active authors by institution stacked up in a, a very digestible way top fields of study compared comparing each of the institutions uh, medicine far and away the, the leader across all of them um, top funders might be of interest split by university top journals where you're publishing this um is interesting proportion of open access works by university um, and you can create your own charts as we looked at before let's um open up the institutions so so it was University of Nigeria. Okay, the other one is N S U K K A, University okay. of Nigeria, Nusuka. N S U K K A. Got it. So we'll limit to just that one. And yeah, I, um, since they suggested it, I, I'd like to. Yeah, that's terrific to see that too. Great. Let's um, look back at this list um, before we change those dashboards. <laughs> And we see that they have 13,000 uh, scholarly works. Um, mm -hmm. 8,000 have been public or cited by papers, cited by 95,000 uh, other scholarly works. Um, 142 of those scholarly works have been cited by patents, cited by 400 patents. We can open up and analyze the patent activities activity. And um, wow, Sun Microsystems among the top of the list. Uh, life mm -hmm. sciences, of course, huh? Looks like they're um, deep into the engineering um, with some of these uh, IT companies at the top of the list. Impressive. Could, could, uh, this is, you know, wonderful and broad and overwhelming almost because of the way, especially you are so, you know, used to searching in it. 
Can anyone maybe put in something in chat of how they think they could use this tool at their institution? Okay. Because it's, you know, it's, I understand we've only seen it for less than an hour and you're going to have to go back and search. But if anyone has an idea of how they could use this, that could be useful to discuss. Does that make sense, Mark? Yeah, that's um, terrific. I invite, um, well, while people are thinking about some good uh, use cases, and I, I can, we get requests from people um, uh, to use it as a discovery tool, um, as an analytics tool to help universities to, um, to assess their own strengths and weaknesses, uh, to benchmark against other organizations. They use it as a tool to populate their faculty um, profile systems. Mm -hmm. um, so they use it in, in lots of different ways. Uh, with that in mind, and while we're, we're back here on okay. this um, results page, I, I'll highlight the export feature. So you can export records just by clicking export, uh, choosing the number of uh, documents to include and the export fields that you choose, and then hit export. Um, and the collections uh, feature is here as well, uh, that I can save this as a collection um, uh, and make it dynamic. I'll just show you quickly how that, that, that happens. Um, so, mm -hmm. view of Nigeria. This is. Um, I can do a description of it to remind myself of how I created this. Um, I can make the uh, collection dynamic or, or not. So if it's a static set and I say what's important to me is the number of scholarly works that are displaying today on, on June 7, I don't want it to update again, then don't uh, select this. If you say, well, I want it to send me an alert um, to the email address that's associated with my registration every time the database is updated, and it adds more records, you can choose that. If you are doing your own research and you wanna be the only one who can view this, you can choose that. If you want to limit it to anyone with um, access to the link, you can choose that. Or if you wanna make it publicly discoverable, like what we saw um, with that list of collections that Richard Jefferson created, you can make that here. I'm not going to save this. Um, okay, okay, we it. have, I'm looking at the chat. I'm so Fred from uh, the Ghana Institution said, I'm thinking about benchmarking similar to SciVal. We have a request to do Addis Ababa University and Mamoun, who is from the ICD, ICDDRB, has raised his hand and has a question for you. So maybe we could turn the floor, uh, let Mamoun ask his question, you know, okay. the, to unmute his there he is yeah, yeah thank you much for your nice presentation and elaborately describe us about the length but i i i need some suggestion from your advice or what i would say we are in trouble you know we have the web of science we have the dimension and we have the length how do we manage to uh, to our management what is the appropriate or is there any option to amalgamate uh, all this uh, mark, all this metrics from from this three or four <laughs> data wells and give them some. <laughs> what do you think? What yeah, that, that's a that's a fantastic question. And um, at the beginning, I uh, or towards the beginning, I said that we're big uh, advocates of open. And I said that I was puzzled that the world continues to talk about open access and talk about open science while we continue to use closed proprietary metrics. So you mentioned at least two sources, which are closed proprietary metrics. Now that means, that, that doesn't mean they're bad tools. They're not bad tools. Um, but when you use them, the license that they provide to you means that you can use them. That means it's not shareable. It's not transparent. It's not verifiable. So the, the difference that Lens presents is a uh, tool that you can give a link to anyone and say, hey, this is the analysis I did. Um, you're free to check it. If you see that I missed a name variant, if you didn't like my um, search query, if you didn't like my filters, um, you, can, you can see that it's transparent. Um, and, and we think that's important for the world to achieve open science. Uh, we think that closed proprietary metrics, when they're used for research assessment, which is probably the most important part of this, um, of the, the, the ecosystem for research and possibly even extending into um, the ecosystem for innovation, 
um, uh, th this is an important difference. Um, so, so that would be a comment. The other comment that uh, this is feedback we get is that we get compared to um, Google Scholar more frequently than the two systems you mentioned uh, because uh, those two look at only journal output. Now there's good reasons that you might only wanna look at journal output. Uh, but if you wanna track citations coming from a much broader field from, um, from gray literature, uh, from other sources that are captured within those, those four main sources that we track, um, then uh, you might want to use the lens instead. We have a, uh, uh, I think this is an easier question than what Mamoun raised. Uh, does lens cover agriculture and agriculture related citations? Uh, the, yeah, the answer is yes, we do. If you <laughs> wanted to limit your search, so you could uh, you could do a field search and um, limit on your topic related to agriculture. If you wanted to be more specific and you said, hey, I really know which journals I want to um, uh, search for my material, I can choose whichever journals you want to choose. You can limit the search there. Um, if you have publishers that you want to pay attention to, uh, more than others, you can limit the search there. Uh, but the subject matter um, is a selection that I think is is important given your question. Uh, the subject um, categories come from uh, a number of different sources. So we've got subject headings, uh, which come from uh, Crossref based on the ISSN descriptions, uh, the, the journal descriptions. We have mesh headings, which are extracted from uh, the PubMed content. Um, and you can, so you can limit to specific uh, mesh headings if that's of interest. We have fields of study. Um, these are extracted, these are built by um, Microsoft when they built the, the Microsoft Academic Graph. And uh, chemical substance names. Uh, th this, this is what I was looking for in patents, uh, but it appears here in scholarly works. Um, so you can search here uh, or limit here. Uh, those are sourced from um, PubMed as well and uh, keywords. Uh, so these are keywords sourced from the PubMed metadata. Um, so we're trying to maintain the rich metadata from each of these different sources and facilitate easier searching. Okay, we have uh, another question. Do you have WO patent classifications? And then uh, can individuals have free access to lens? And the answer would be you log in through your uh, you log into Research for Life and then individuals would have free access to Lens through your institution. Yeah. I think I answered that one. Do you have WO patent classifications? So I went into the patent uh, database here. Um, so it's new patent search and I can look at the uh, classifications that we cover. We have CPC, uh, IPCR and US. Um, I, I think that CPC is what W uh, what WIPO uses, um, but it, you can correct me if I'm wrong. He said, good, thanks. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. We're at an hour, uh, which is wonderful. We still have time. Uh, yes, Marcia noted that the lens covers agriculture. She did check on that. And uh, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. I failed to show all my slides at the beginning, something happened. So I might spend a minute doing that, but uh, if we have maybe time for one or two more questions, is uh, that all right with you, Mark? Sure, I, I'm sure. enjoying this. Okay, maybe we could have uh, an agriculture subject. Uh, Sadient, if you could quick, put in uh, a specific agriculture subject, we could look at that. That would be kind of a good way to f finish this up. No answer yet. I'll, I'll open up chat so that I can, um, oh, whoops. I'm having no. trouble opening the chat, so I'll still depend on you. <laughs> okay, we have we have no more requests. Uh, wait, uh, Marcia says we think we're out of time. The webinar was scheduled for one hour.
So <laughs> at this point, uh, since we, we didn't get any more questions, we really appreciate your time. I know that the people that participated, this was quite fascinating and they ha may have more questions for you. Uh, will this brilliant presentation be available? Yes. The answer would be yes. We will put it on the uh, uh, the Research for Life training portal page that's titled webinars. Can Lens allow postgraduate student to have free access to the lens? Uh, if you're a postgraduate student, you're at an institution. So I think that solves that problem. Uh, can individuals like postgraduate students have free access directly? That's a good question for Mark. Um, uh, yes, um, the answer is yes. Try to go ahead and access um, lens.org. Um, uh, we, we encourage you to use the, lens, the Research for Life platform because that keeps you connected within your whole ecosystem. When you, you do the full text links out of lens.org, those will work better. Uh, but you can link over to lens.org as a um, postgraduate student. Okay, I missed the beginning. We'll look out for the recording. That's from Mercy in Zambia. Well, I appreciate all of you at different hours of the day, especially uh, Mark in the evening. And I noticed there were several people from Asia, so you're not the only person. And uh, Edith has noted when the presentation and the webinar will be available in the chat. Uh, I mean, it, that it will be available with, as soon as we do the technical aspects. So uh, I appreciate everyone participating. We thank you, Mark. This, uh, I hope that this results in more people using the lens. At least we've reached a number of people and we will send out the link to the presentation to all the people that registered so that people who missed it can pick it up that way. Again, thank you for your time. Uh, a couple more thank yous in the chat. And I think we're about done. So uh, um, I guess we can close off. Yeah, okay. let Thank me, you very much. Sorry, yes. just to mention that the webinar recording will be also be uploaded on the Research for Life website in June yeah. course. Yes. OK. Thank you. And we see a number of thank yous. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank, okay. you, thank you very thank much. You much. Safe. Safe. Thank you, Bye. Mark. Have a peaceful rest of the evening. <laughs> thank you very much.